Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to all of you. My name is Professor Heather Zwicker and I'm the Executive Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University of Queensland and I'm here representing as well our Vice Chancellor Professor Deborah Terry AO who wishes that she could have been her herself. I begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people as traditional owners and pay my respects to their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. On behalf of all of us involved in this function, I wish to pay respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue such important cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. I would like to acknowledge the following people the Honourable Ken Wyatt, Minister for Indigenous Affairs, the Honourable Margaret White, AO, and Professor Tom Kalma, who are patrons of the Churchill Trust, and David Trebek, Chair of the Churchill Trust, Adam Davey, CEO of the Churchill Trust, parliamentary members and staff, senior departmental staff, industry representatives, and Churchill Fellows and staff, a very warm welcome to you all. It is more exciting to be in Canberra than I can say. <laughs> Until yesterday, it had been, I believe, 13 months and four days, but not that I was counting, since I'd been on a plane, and my heart thrilled to the tiny trays and that tone of apologetic imperiousness that you sometimes get on airplanes and the iffy card key at the, at the hotel, all of that. It's really, it's really wonderful uh, to be here. And uh, of course, I also want to acknowledge that people who are coming up from Melbourne will also be excited to, for instance, shake hands. <laughs> I am absolutely delighted to see this partnership between the University of Queensland and the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust come to fruition. This groundbreaking collaboration was the brainchild of Professor Karen Hussey, our former director of the Centre for Policy Futures at UQ, and now Deputy Director General of Queensland's Department of Environment and Science. As the story goes, she was driving home one night in 2019, enjoying a fascinating interview on Radio National's Law and Society Report. The interviewee was Jennifer, or Jenny, Bowles, a magistrate in the Children's Court of Victoria and a Churchill Fellow, and she's here with us today. Jenny had returned from her Churchill Fellowship in New Zealand, the United Kingdom and Sweden with concrete ideas about how Australia's family court system could be reformed to provide better rehabilitation outcomes for young people. It was a light bulb moment for Karen, and any of you in the room who know this will know immediately that meant it was a light bulb moment for all of us. The Winston Churchill Trust funds people to travel abroad and explore all sorts of ideas with the aim of bringing that knowledge and best practice back to Australia. What if? The Centre for Policy Futures, with its attention to turning research into policy, was able to partner with the Winston Churchill Trust in order to address pressing and contemporary policy issues. We are proud of our record at the University of Queensland uh, for knowledge exchange with governments and societies to help solve some of the biggest challenges we face at the moment. And again, when Karen wants to see something to completion, she does. So here we are. Without further ado, I would like to introduce the Honourable Minister for Indigenous Affairs, Ken Wyatt. Minister Wyatt created history in 2010 when he was elected as the first Indigenous member of the House of Representatives. In 2016, he became the first Indigenous minister to serve in a federal government after being appointed as the Minister for Aged Care and the Minister for Indigenous Health. Before entering politics, Minister Wyatt worked in community roles in the field of health and education, including serving as District Director for the Swan Educational Districts and the Director of Aboriginal Health in New South Wales and Western Australia. 
He brings this wealth of knowledge, as well as a lifetime of personal experience, to his current portfolio. It's my pleasure to welcome him here to address us. Can I thank you for that, Will? I want to start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people and the on whose land we stand and honour their um, elders past and present. It's important. But I'd like to acknowledge the following people who are here today, the Honourable Margaret White, patron of the Churchill Trust, Professor Tom Kalmer, patron of the Churchill Trust. Everywhere I go, Tom, I see you. <laughs> uh, Mr David uh, Trebeck, chair of the Churchill Trust, Mr. Adam Davey, CEO of the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust. Professor Deborah, Deborah Terry, Vice Chancellor of the University of Queensland and the Chair of Universities Australia. And Professor Heather uh, Zika, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at the University. Parliamentary colleagues, Churchill Fellows. And the Churchill Fellows, I want to thank you for the work that you've done. Often in society, there are moments in which there is a light bulb moment in thinking. And the research you've undertaken highlights the way in which you've had a concept within your mind but saw the value of exploring the opportunities. That if we were to apply this to a think tank approach, then what you've done is you've led a think tank of thinkers to take on board those areas that are passionate to you. And when I think about that in the context of Sir Winston Churchill, he resigned as the British Prime Minister in 1955 at the age, which was young, 80. He had served under five reigning monarchs, survived three world wars, had been a writer, historian, journalist, adventurer, and a painter on top of being a member of the British Parliament. He was also awarded a Nobel Prize for Literature in 1953. I was only one year old then. A great man indeed. So it's not surprising that in the wake of his passing, so many people across the Commonwealth were determined to honour his public service, inspiration, intellect and humour. Through this, the concept of travelling fellowships came about, a trust to raise local money to support everyday Australians with a life-changing opportunity, to travel overseas to conduct research in their chosen field and a platform to share findings with the Australian community. Any Australian with passion and a commitment to making a difference in Australian society can apply for a fellowship. With no bounds on the project topic, the diversity of findings is broad. What fascinated me that was when he passed away, our then Prime Minister, Sir Robert Menzies, led the creation of a Churchill Trust for Australia. The planning for the appeal to raise funds for the establishment of a Churchill Trust in Australia was run under the code name Operation G. And a lot of us wouldn't have thought about what the G was, but it was about gratitude. There had only ever been one national fundraising appeal in Australia at the time for the Hart Foundation. And so the volunteer collectors began one of the biggest and most significant public fundraising efforts in Australia's history. They exceeded the original target of one million, well and truly, and the national door-knocking campaign saw organisations, community groups, clubs and individuals rally to eventually raise £2.2 .2 million. If you index that effort, it still remains one of the largest public fundraising efforts in Australia's history. It is the only time in our history that the banks opened on a Sunday. The one day, or the day of the one day door knock, so that the money could be deposited. That was a great effort, and today I'm pleased to see that this has come to that, what has come of that effort. What we have here today, including in this room, is a group of remarkable individuals supported and funded by Australia's past and present as an investment in our country and in our people. For over 50 years, the Churchill Fellows have been contributing to the betterment of this country in so many areas and in so many ways. 
and from so many walks of life, covering so many topics, and I commend them for that. This includes the work that Scott Falkner is doing in advocating for the use of Indigenous traditional land management and jobs for Indigenous Australians, and Jessica Cox's important work in child safety, including the safety of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children. I've always quoted uh, a man who I admired strongly, and I want to use his words again just today. Education has the power to change lives. Nelson Mandela once said that change is driven by the weapon of education, that the daughter of a minor can become a doctor, that the son of a peasant be can become the president of a great country. And that's why this fellowship is so important. Because when you take a concept or an idea and you apply for a fellowship and you have the opportunity to travel to other countries, what you see is that there is a a board of opportunities that is like an artist's palette, that in each location there are qualities and outstanding individuals that you engage with in order to acquire the knowledge for your chosen field. And when you bring that together, you bring back ideas for our nation that changes the concepts that we may be take as part of the status quo and accept as ordinary, everyday approaches. When I read some of the uh, extracts and reports in today's report, what fascinated me was the new ideas that, and there's two authors who I'll follow up with because they've presented me with some other lines of thinking that we should seriously engage around. And that is the one to do with children in out-of-home care or children who are taken into care. But what I loved was the proposition that we should invest in the parenting element, not in the residual. That if we intervene early, then the destiny of a child can be changed. That if we take the time to explore other avenues and other opportunities, it creates an incredible reform that sometimes is not contested in the mind of ideas that are important. And so if we think of everybody who has travelled away on a Churchill Fellowship, then that's an incredible encyclopaedia of key areas that are important to the social fabric and structure of our nation. Even the recognition of cultural burning and the way in which knowledge is transmitted, but is not transmitted just to Indigenous Australians, but to anybody who has a role in the management of the land and fire control. So I want to commend everybody, not only the, the trustees, but to all of those who have been participants, but equally to those who weren't recipients of a Churchill Fellowship, who thought about the possibility of accessing an avenue in order to enhance their own knowledge. When you consider Churchill's statesmanship, then what we're doing is creating the opportunity for Australians to take a position on a topic that is close to their heart, to explore it, to consider the avenues of so many ideas and then to come back and share that. That's what's important and that is the ongoing legacy of the fellowships because those fellowships not only inform the individual but they inform other Australians. So in keeping with your plan to start the Trust Operation G, I'd like to say, show my gratitude by saying younger, or thank you in younger. And I look at the words there, learn globally, inspire locally. That's a powerful transition of shifting knowledge from one location or several locations to a point of intersection that makes a difference 
for everyday Australians who are challenged, but whose thinking also may show that they want a future that is based on a better outcome for the generations that follow them. In a sense, we're looking at our grandchildren when we do this work. And what we're doing is hoping to influence policy in a very constructive way that gives everyone a chance to think, to contribute, and to enjoy a better life. So if I look in this room, we've got so many Churchill fellows and trustees, it's really uh, like having the Churchill policy room and being part of a team of people whose passion and commitment wants to make a difference. So it's a great pleasure to be here uh, to say that I love what you do. I want to say that I am pleased to launch that whole concept of the Churchill Policy Room on a virtual basis because you transcend not only your community but you transcend our country and other countries because in your conversations with people, in your quest for knowledge, you would have also challenged their thinking and had them reflect on the questions that you asked. So congratulations to all and it's great to be here with you today. Thank you very much for those remarks, which were um, warm and far-seeing in equal, in equal measure. Thank you very much. I would now like to introduce the Honorable Margaret White, patron of the Churchill Trust and former Supreme Court of Queensland Justice, uh, the first woman to sit on the Supreme Court of Queensland, in fact. We also think of her at UQ as one of ours, since she was on our Senate for, I think, 17 years. Uh, and I know that Deborah Terry wishes that she could have been here personally to greet you. In August 2016, Margaret was appointed Joint Commissioner with Mick Gouda for the Royal Commission into the Protection and Detention of Children in the Northern Territory. And she'll address us now. May I respectfully associate myself with the acknowledgement of country and of the distinguished persons here this afternoon. We're most grateful to you, Minister Wyatt, for hosting this event, and that a number of honourable members or their staff have been able to come and hear from our Policy Futures Fellows. You will not be disappointed. Winston Churchill, that most quotable of men, sagely observed that the best argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter. <laughs> and no doubt, you all chat with many voters. Well, there's nothing average about our fellows. As Churchill also said, my tastes are simple. I'm easily satisfied with the best. And the fellows are the best in their field. Most of the over 4,000 fellows from all walks of life have lived up to their promise of returning to Australia and making a difference. Some became or have become household names. Can I give you a quick snapshot of a very few? I can do no better than start with Cathy McGowan, a farmer in Victoria who was awarded her fellowship to study methods used by the Canadian government to communicate and consult with rural communities particularly with women. She travelled to Canada in 1990 and was inspired by the advances made there, recognising the contribution which country women made to the economy. Cathy, of course, was elected the independent member for the federal seat of Indi in 2013 and became an important voice in this parliament. She was also on the selection panel for our Policy Future Fellows. The ABC's Gardening Australia has three fellows amongst its presenters. Now, that may surprise you. The indefatigable Peter Cundall, in 1974, investigated, clearly to great effect, 
the use of TV to educate about the benefits of gardening. The master of all things citrus, Ian Tolley, was in the first cohort of travellers in 1966, and more recently, Leonie Norrington in 2020 from the top end. Dimity Dornan, a speech therapist, travelled to America to explore auditory verbal therapy for profoundly deaf children when cochlear implants were commencing. And so was born the idea of the Hear and Say Centres, now throughout Australia and the entire world, dramatically enhancing the lives of these children. Geraldine Doog is a journalist who has made an important contribution to the discussion of social, religious or cultural subjects. She travelled on her fellowship in 2000, but she is just one of a number of media-related fellows. Jill Margot of the Australian Financial Review has, I suspect, done more than even the medical profession to advance issues relating to men's health, particularly amongst businessmen. She received her fellowship in 2011. Richard Feidler, who keeps us entertained on long road trips whilst weeding the garden and pounding the pavements, was a 2003 fellow. Amongst the more earthly delights, I mentioned the renowned winemaker Cyril Henschke and 18 other vignerons. <laughs> There have been sufficient musicians to fill a large orchestra. Piers Lane, the pianist. Genevieve Lacey, the world famous recorder virtuoso. Harpist Marshall Maguire. And our youngest Churchill Fellow ever, at 14 years, the late brilliant pianist Geoffrey Tozer. It would be a grievous oversight not to mention Her Excellency the Honourable Linda Dessau, Governor of Victoria, who was awarded her fellowship in 1994 to examine efficiencies in court processes. Her proposed reforms have been adopted around the country. She also served on the board of the Trust. Nine fellowships in all were awarded in the 20 years from 1966 for participation in the Harvard University Trade Union Program in Boston. One of those early fellows became Premier of New South Wales, Barry Unsworth. Wherever I've been in our country, and whatever the activity, a Churchill Fellow is bound to bob up doing something to improve the life of our people. When I was engaged in the Royal Commission in the Northern Territory with Mick Gooder from 2016 to 17, I swelled with pride when we heard from a witness that his or her expertise was enhanced by being a Churchill Fellow. We even had one on a video link from Scotland who was a UK Churchill Fellow. Now, of course, two, as you've heard, are associated with this initiative. Magistrate Bowles, from whom you'll hear shortly, and Jared Sharp, a lawyer who was on the selection panel. We have chosen clowns, ceramicists, a doll maker, a saddle maker, cheese makers, a llama breeder, a horse farrier, every kind of allied health worker, medical doctors, and even lawyers. <laughs> and every year since 1966, there have been projects to enhance the lives of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people of this country by Indigenous and non-Indigenous fellows every year. And that was before 1967, of course, Tom. The breadth and depth of talent are staggering. They have been and are and will be agents for change and inspiration throughout our country, and I salute them all. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I would now like to introduce and turn the podium over to Mr. David Trebek, Chair of the Churchill Trust Board, and himself, a Churchill Fellow from 1974, perhaps the llama breeder. <laughs> no, regrettably not the llama breeder. Thank you, Heather, and thank you, Minister, again, for your uh, involvement here in launching this uh, really quite exciting project. 
Uh, it is a pleasure for me to be uh, involved in the, in the launch of Policy Futures, not only as Chair of the Trust, but also someone whose whole professional career has focused on policy reform of one sort or another. Policy Futures is a milestone for the Trust. Over and above the subject matter uh, of, of individual chapters, it exemplifies, as we've been hearing, the quality and astonishing diversity of the Churchill family of now nearly 4,600 Australian Churchill Fellows. It does also illustrate one of our current priorities, to provide more assistance to Fellows for their career development once they've finished travelling. Assistance that can enable them to reach a broader audience, extend the coverage of their fellowship topic, and ultimately make a substantive contribution to policy debate. And finally, it's one way the Trust is adapting to the post-COVID environment via new initiatives. In this case, a cooperative venture with the University of Queensland, whose enthusiasm I commend. The Minister referred to the origins of the Trust, including the door-knocking uh, fundraising campaign in 1965, at which no fewer than 220,000 door knockers took part. Today, following careful management, sponsorships, bequests and other donations, we manage over $120 million, the income from which funds the fellowships and the trust administration. Each year since 1966, fellowships have been awarded to Australians from all walks of life, another expression you've already heard, to travel overseas on a project of their design. Average travel is between six and eight weeks and has involved almost every country on the globe. The focus of topics varies, broadly reflecting the issues of the day, without the trust needing to stipulate or restrict them. The selection process is competitive, with around 110 of being successful from roughly 10 times that number of applicants. The calibre of fellows, of which today's cohort of 11 is but a small sample, is uniformly impressive. As Margaret has just noted, they are contributing positively in almost every sphere of economic and community endeavour. Before introducing the individual fellows to you, I'd like to share a cameo involving a 2018 Northern Territory Fellow, Maida Stewart. Maida is an Aboriginal health practitioner whose topic was to research healthy housing designed to reduce the incidence of acute rheumatic fever, a preventable streptococcal disease unfortunately prevalent in parts of the Territory. One challenge the Trust has encountered is that some potentially worthy applicants, particularly from remote areas of Australia, have lacked confidence to travel on their own. In Maida's case, she, her son accompanied her to Auckland for the period of her travel. Previously, her son had suffered social anxiety to the point where he often struggled with simple socialising. This affected his self-esteem making it difficult for him to live a normal life. It was therefore a massive step to travel to Auckland, his first overseas travel experience. Once there, however, not only did he explore the Auckland region, he attended a number of meetings with his mother, interacting with the hosts and sharing stories. As a direct result of this experience, he has now gained sufficient confidence to enrol in an IT course at Charles Darwin University with the aim of becoming a cyber security specialist. In, in Maida's view, this story demonstrates how Churchill Fellowships are transformative and life-changing not only for the Fellows themselves, but also for their loved ones. Let me now introduce the authors of Policy Futures. Firstly, from Victoria, uh, Jennifer Bowles, you've up to, now up the back. Stay there, Jennifer. I just, uh, I need to take my glasses off to read, but I can't quite see you up the back now. <laughs> Jennifer is a 2018 Churchill Fellow who travelled to New Zealand, the UK and Sweden to review options for residential therapeutic 
treatment for young people suffering substance abuse and mental illness. Second, Scott Falconer, uh, 2017 Melbourne Lord Mayor's Bushfire Appeal Churchill Fellowship, who travelled to the US and Canada to create close partnerships with and job, jobs for traditional owners of in fire and land management. And Scott was accompanied by Trent Nelson, uh, chairperson of the Jar Jar Wurrung Clans Aboriginal Corporation, who is also with us today. Claire Seppings, 2015 Churchill Fellow, who travelled to the UK, Ireland, Sweden and the US to study the role of ex-prisoners and offenders as peer mentors in reintegration models. Taryn Lane, 2016 Churchill Fellow, who travelled to Germany, Denmark, Austria, Sweden and the UK to learn from European regional towns trans transitioning to 100% renewable energy. From the ACT, Megan Gilmore, 2016 Churchill Fellow who travelled to Finland, Sweden, the Netherlands, Belgium, UK and Canada to investigate school connection models for seriously sick children. Katrina Marzen, 2018 Peter Mitchell Churchill Fellow who travelled to Germany, the Netherlands and the UK to research practical methods to prevent sexual violence through youth education. From New South Wales, Jessica Cox, 2016 Churchill Fellow who travelled to the US, Canada, Norway and the UK to research innovative parent, family inclusion and partnership approaches in child welfare and to whom the Minister has already referred. Natalia uh, Krizyak, uh, 2018 Churchill Fellow who travelled to Singapore, China, Japan, Canada and the UK to investigate best practice for designing child-friendly, high-density neighbourhoods. From Tasmania, Steve Harrison, 2015 Park Family Churchill Fellowship, who travelled to Norway and the UK to investigate school-to-work apprenticeship pathways in the aquaculture salmon industry. And from Queensland, Catherine Webber, 2018 Rodney Warmington Churchill Fellow who travelled to the Netherlands, Germany, UK, US and Canada to increase accessibility to public toilets by researching taboos, design, policy and legal bar barriers. And finally, to, from South Australia, Owen Churches, who unfortunately due to a, a bout of chicken pox is unable to join us today, and Owen's uh, fellowship in 2018 saw him travel to the UK, Belgium and Austria to explore fairness and accountability in the use of government decision-making algorithms. Again, another topical uh, project, particularly in this building. Three of these fellows will now speak briefly, and we've got to keep our eye on the clock because question time uh, looms. And I'd like to commence by inviting Jennifer Bowles to the stage. And before, before we do so, unfortunately, our time is a bit short and the Minister will have to depart in case he is the subject of the first question at two o'clock. <laughs> Minister, thank you again very much. No, thank you. Thank you. To everyone here present, distinguished guests, I was going to acknowledge the Minister, I think he's gone. Um, welcome. I'd like to commence by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the people of the Ngunnawal country, and pay my respects to Elders, past, present and emerging. I've been a Magistrate for over 22 years and for most of that time I've sat in the Children's Court of Victoria. I'm so pleased and proud to present to you today in my capacity as a Churchill Fellow and part of the inaugural Policy Impact Program. And on behalf of all of us Fellows, um, I would like to thank everyone involved in the program. I'd like to read an extract from a poem written by a person I've called Greg. 
When he came before me, he didn't have a criminal history. However, he had a long-standing dependence on alcohol and cannabis. He was in custody for repeated thefts of bottles of vanilla essence, which has a 35% alcohol content. He'd experienced a number of psychotic episodes for which he'd been hospitalised. Whilst in custody, he wrote, I pray for a saviour to help me conquer my compulsive behaviour, which keeps leading me into trouble and life-threatening danger. I feel weighed down and burdened with responsibility, having to work on getting better and back to normality. It seems like it's all too much after years of such fuss. I'm prepared to give up and declare that I've had enough. If I am to die, please keep in mind that I did try. Tears come to my eyes. At times, I've contemplated suicide. On three occasions, we arranged for Greg to attend a seven-day residential detox program, but such was the force of his addiction, he left within a few hours and continued to steal and drink, being found unconscious on a driveway. He assaulted his mother when she did not give him money to buy cannabis, and he became embedded in the criminal justice system. This is what I see every day in court, young people without hope. For those in detention, almost 90% have a history of alcohol or drug use. Significantly, 83% offended whilst they're under the influence of drugs or alcohol. More than two thirds are victims of abuse, trauma or neglect. And 57% of young people in detention in Australia identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, and yet their young people are only 6% of the population. In 100, every week, 135 young people in child protection go missing from care. That's every week. The current system is not working for young people with serious substance abuse issues, as they must voluntarily engage in treatment, but for the most part, they don't. The purpose of my Churchill Fellowship was to determine whether court-ordered, mandated treatment commencing in a secure home could be effective. I visited a number of facilities in Sweden, England, Scotland and New Zealand, ranging from inpatient wards, secure homes, residential programs and outreach services. In short, the answer to my question was yes. Overwhelmingly, the views expressed by experts and young people I spoke to were that mandatory treatment can be as effective as voluntary treatment, provided certain critical elements are present. From these models, I developed the what can be done model. The key policy recommendations include to amend legislation to enable children's courts to make youth therapeutic orders. The order would place the young person initially in a secure but homely residence with committed and high quality staff, a therapeutic community model, education and training, and a culturally safe environment. There would then be step down homes on site followed by effective transition and support to the community. My recommendations are supported by all of the key industry leaders in Victoria. I'm imploring the federal government, <laughs> Dr. Allen, uh, to lead the national response for effective mandated substance abuse treatment for young people, to take the model to national cabinet and provide funding to the states and territories to support the establishment of the model. The daily cost of the model is less than or comparable to the costs of detention. My model enables early intervention to disrupt the tragic trajectory these young people otherwise face. Society benefits both from improved safety and economically. As for every dollar spent on alcohol and drug treatment, the return is a saving of $8 in health costs, welfare benefits and the justice system. Thank you. It's now my pleasure. Sorry. It's now my pleasure to introduce Scott Falconer and Trent Nelson to speak on how self-determination is returning white smoke to country. Thanks. Delkaya, Jadarag Nyotiora Guli, Delkunya Murup. Just like to pay respects to the Ngunnawal people, the land we meet here today. Uh, and pay respects from my ancestors from central Victoria as well. Cultural burning heals my people and the land. Cultural fire is fire applied to country by traditional owners for a myriad of reasons. Its application provides a unique opportunity to connect my mob to country, to Jundak. In 2018, I travelled with Scott to the USA and Canada to meet 
with First Nations people to see how they were working together to reintroduce cultural practices of fire. We found surprising similarities and a genuine desire to work together in an approach that provides true caring for country, healing, cultural knowledge, jobs and economic opportunities for Aboriginal people. Managing country using fire strengthens the identity of Aboriginal people. It increases our presence on the land to practice law, L-O-R-E, and fulfil our cultural obligations. This builds the health and well-being of our people through a living culture. Health of our country is also improved. It offers possibilities to heal the land in a holistic way, applying traditional knowledge to build resilience to nature disasters such as recent catastrophic bushfires, reducing fuels, regenerating degrading landscapes, controlling weeds and restoring the balance of species and ecosystems. Cultural fire is the key to this. The story to, in America and Australia is the same. When we returned from our journey, the first two traditional owners led cultural burns, including myself, were implemented by my mob in partnership with DELP, a government organisation. This was the first known time cultural fire had occurred on Jara country in 170 plus years. It was an emotional and powerful moment, particularly for me and my elders and my family, which today we continue to grow and learn from that practices. Thank you. Um, thanks a lot, Trent, and it's a true honour to be with you here again. Um, the need for cultural fire is so clear. There's no downside to this. However, traditional owners have limited rights and access to managed country, at least in places like Victoria and New South Wales and other states where public land is largely managed by the Crown. Major lessons from our journey included the legal rights and connection to Aboriginal people to country must be recognised. Trust is critical and must be established between parties, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal alike. This must be built over time and is the key to forming meaningful partnerships, and that's at the heart of this work. Self-determination um, is a driving principle of all collaboration. This means that traditional owners lead this process at their pace with sustained support and resourcing from governments and their agencies. Since that first historic effort that Trent mentioned, more than 30 cultural burns have been implemented in Victoria using the lessons we took from overseas and here, and 120 more are planned over the next three years nominated by six different traditional owner groups in Victoria. These are positive steps, however more needs to be done, both at the state and federal level, to support and embed this practice, particularly at the national scale. Together we need to establish a state and national Indigenous policy partnership groups to bring together representatives from fire and emergency management agencies to work with traditional owners. And there are three key things we need to do there. Identify and remove regulatory and social barriers to traditional owners' ability to manage country. There is an opportunity to create a national Indigenous-led network of fire practitioners, supported and sustained funding to bring together both volunteers and paid practitioners engaged in collaborative land and bushfire management initiatives with traditional owners. And lastly, but not least, support traditional owners to develop a um, science-based, led by them, research program that aligns with cultural fire initiatives. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, and it's my pleasure to um, introduce a fellow fellow, Steve Harrison. <laughs> I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land and their, <coughs> their ancestors and their leaders, uh, past and present and developing. And my passion is developing new leaders. On my Churchill Fellowship to Norway, I found that 96% of students studying a vocational education and training program in the final years of secondary school gain employment in their field of training. In Australia, over 220,000 students study VET courses in years 11 and 12 each year, yet only 40% get jobs in, the, in their field. Imagine where our economy and the future of our young people would be if a further 125,000 VET students gained employment out of their courses. We might not have ever needed job trainer. So, why don't they? All of us here have experienced the culture of a school, 
And all of us here have experienced the culture of a workplace. And all of us here know that school is nothing like the real world of work. Ironically, our often criticised industrial model of education is nothing like modern industry, nor does it serve it in terms of employment outcomes. The problem we have in Australia is a clash between cultures, between a culture based on an education logic in our school and one based on an employment logic in industry. So why is Norway so successful? Norway is successful because it structures its school vet programs like workplaces, not like schools. But you say we've got simulated workplaces in our schools, amazing facilities, workshops, commercial kitchens. Well, we do, but the modern world of work is based on relationships and social constructs. A physically simulated workplace is not enough. We need socially simulated workplaces in schools where we don't treat 17 and 18 year olds like children, but like employees. Where educators stop being authority figures and start being workplace coaches, treating students as partners in the organisation, encouraging their input and trusting them to carry out complex tasks. Where we have a positive model of performance improvement as opposed to a deficit model of behaviour management. Where industry is welcomed as partners and clients of the training rather than as entities solely to support the school. If we are to address the recommendations of the Shergold report into senior secondary pathways, we must make industry equal partners in vetting schools. And for that, we need an equal playing field of a similar employment culture. A cultural shift is a mindset shift. It costs nothing to implement, but we do need incentives to make it happen. Funding for school vet could be linked to the implementation of cultural change. The new industry training hubs which are being rolled out, the first of which, was in, which is in Burnie, Tasmania, could be given a specific role in helping schools and industries address the cultural clash. ASQA, the Australian Skills Quality Authority, could divert some RTO compliance attention to the training delivery environments where the simulated workplaces are socially simulated. In Australia today, school is nothing like the real world. In the field of VET, at the very least, let's make it real. And that's just three of them, people. You are great, such exciting, such exciting fellows to have in our midst. Um, I would invite you all to seek out the Churchill Fellows, have a conversation with them over afternoon tea. Uh, you're very welcome to arrange future meetings with them if you would like. And we are uh, going to reconvene at about half past three, at which point we will hear from more of the fellows. And so you're very, very welcome to come back and join us at that time if you, uh, if you are able to do so. I think there might be COVID limited numbers. So just be in touch with somebody who conducts and comports themselves in an official looking way if you wish to come back. <laughs> I'm not across the detail for that, sorry. <laughs> I would also invite you to take a copy of some of the materials that are around. Every one of the, of the fellows has a little policy document that lays out the, in brief, the, the project that they've undertaken. And then this is the inaugural magazine that lays out um, the full program in, in all of its glory. I will um, just take one tiny second to thank Jennifer Yarnold, who took over this project from, um, from Karen Hussey. It's, it's, it is one thing to have the idea, it's quite another to be the person who sees it all the way through to the end. And so Jennifer, we're really, really, um, we're really grateful to you and to everyone else in the Pol Center for Policy Futures for all you've done. Thank you for coming. Enjoy your afternoon tea. <laughs>